Well, good afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce you to, uh, or welcome you to, another um, installment of the Foundry Institute at Ohio Christian University. Uh, my name is uh, John Kalaga. I'm the president of Ohio Christian University. And the Foundry Institute is just a arm of our church relations office uh, geared towards and targeted to those who are in uh, Christian ministry, whether it be uh, full-time or part-time. And it's just a way for us to uh, hopefully be a resource or a thought leader on different topics. And we've had different topics over the last several months. Today's topic is uh, church planting. And it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome the pastor of one church in Gahanna, Pastor Greg Ford, um, pastor of where my three uh, adult children attend. And um, Greg's a church planner. They're his church, one church just celebrated a few days ago <coughs> their 11th birthday. So about 12 years ago, and we'll hear a little bit about that, but about 12 years or so ago, uh, Greg and his wife um, left their church in Toledo and uh, came down to Columbus and started one church. And then uh, about a year after that, they launched and they've just celebrated their 11th birthday and they're now in their 12th year. So uh, Greg, welcome. Thank you. It's Dr. Great. Claga, thanks for having me. And it's been a joy to be on campus and you have just a beautiful uh, facility and, and property here and the, the hospitality has been amazing. So thank, and thanks for letting me be a part of this conversation. Yeah. Well, Greg is here for Revival Week on campus. And so this is, we're squeezing him in between a couple services. So it's great to have you here. So just tell me real briefly, first of all, tell me just briefly about your, your wife and your kids. <clears throat> and, but then also then reel back about 11 years ago. I'm thinking of the audience here being people interested in church planting, mm -hmm. not 12 years down the road, but like I'm thinking about planting a church or I'm right now in the middle of planting a church. So what was the uh, impetus that you went from uh, maybe being a youth pastor mm -hmm. to like, you know, I think I want to plant a church. Yeah. So that's kind of a switch. So yeah. just tell us a little bit about your family, but then what made you and Shaylin kind of think this church planting might be our thing? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. You know, so we're a family of five, uh, my wife Shayla and I. At the time, uh, we only had one child. Our daughter was one, okay. and uh, I was 29 years old, and I was kind of just feeling a shift as a youth pastor. I love youth ministry, still love youth ministry. Um, but we, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to work for leaders that gave me quite a bit of freedom. And in a sense, uh, our youth ministry was almost like a church within a church. Uh, we were doing groups, we were doing evangelism, we were doing pastoral care, um, you know, we were doing all, all of those things. I was preaching every week. So in a sense, it was kind of an opportunity to cut my teeth uh, in sort of a microcosm of church. I found myself uh, starting to become opinionated about the church as a whole. And of course, as I want to be a good staff member, I highly respect and still respect, and, and certainly at that time, my, my leader. And so I didn't want to step on his toes or run up his back in any way. I only wanted to be a blessing. But I would start to have feelings and thoughts about, you know, our whole church's uh, groups or things we could do. And so I might make suggestions here and there, and some of them were taken, and, and some of them were like, you know, uh, that may not be right for this. And I think he was correct. I mean, God puts leaders in position to make wise decisions. But I kind of got to the place where I thought, you know, I, I think I want to try some of these ideas on for size. And uh, so we started to explore. I thought maybe I would go take an existing church. Uh, we had thought about missions a little bit. And then the idea of church plan. Okay, if you rewind uh, 13 years ago, basically, okay. when we started first having the idea. Okay. Church planting was a little different now than it is today. It was kind of starting to get traction. You had some networks that would do matching funds or right. um, really provide more support. And so we started to get very curious about that. I reached out to some mentors and um, just wanted to find out, am I Am I a church planner? Am I, am I gifted for this? Right. You know, it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to go, has God put this in my DNA? And is this the assignment God's given me? So we kind of went into that exploration. I went, I did what's called a Red, Ridley assessment. I think it was like 17 point assessment okay. um, through the church multiplication network. And then just started, uh, my wife and I started praying about it and talking about it and imagining it, you know, and all of this. And, and uh, so we kind of went on that journey. I don't know how many details you want, but we went to some different cities and kind of came to a place where we honed in on Columbus, Ohio. And- uh, Was and there something about- um, Northeast Columbus, was it something? Because Columbus is two million people, right? The metro area, yeah. It wasn't it wasn't 13 years ago, but it was still a million. Yeah. But what what was there something about the, the mix, the neighborhood, the community? 
that yeah like that besides the holy spirit saying sure this is it yeah i mean we started like really spiritual okay <laughs> so it started out as like you know, totally open-minded, open-hearted, praying and, and, and waiting for God to sort of write something in the clouds or to, to speak, you know, a word into our minds and hearts, and then we go, this is it. And we did that, and, it, and we didn't really feel any clear direction. So what we started doing was um, being what I call patiently aggressive, which is we're going to be patient, but we're not going to sit around and wait. So I, I reached out to mentors. At, we had an open door in Orlando, Florida, which we thought— um, they were going to kind of help us with fundraising and all this. So we, it, it seemed like it, it kind of seemed like it might be God. So yeah. we, we kind of went and explored and didn't feel peace in our spirit about it. So we kind of, we got some advice. We were down there though. And we, a mentor said, you know, Greg, if God, you know, whispers a city in your ear, then go for it. But if not, start looking around and going, where do I want to live? Okay. You know, where, where do I want to raise my family? And so my wife and I felt you know, connected to Columbus. And we just started driving into communities and then walking around, talking to people and praying. And, and just to kind of see, man, is there any chemistry here? And we came into an area in Northeast Columbus where they were just building some new uh, apartments and it was called Lifestyle Communities. It was kind of a creative thing that was going on. They still had cranes and dump trucks um, that we're still building it out. Okay. And so we could feel kind of that, that new energy. Um, people were out walking their dogs and, you know, riding their bikes. And we were just engaging people. And it, best I can describe, it felt like home. Okay. And so we wanted to be careful. We weren't impulsive. We came back three or four times to go, man, do we, is this still, do we still feel this? And at some point we just, both of us felt confirmed. This is where we're supposed to start. And so we you know, and then again, my pastor at that time, he came with me to Columbus and walked and prayed the city. And when he put his stamp on it, you know, I felt the boldness. You know, he, he yeah. said, Greg, I think this is it. I think this fits you guys. This, I really sense in my spirit, this is a move. And, uh, and so we did. So we took a step of faith. So you weren't, um, I'm asking, I'm not telling you, but um, were you like given this huge dump truck load of money? No. And just sent down and said, okay, here you go. You're set up for three years don't worry about it or did you and your wife just have to hit the ground find jobs yep do what you had to do yes so my last sunday at at our church uh in toledo they let me preach they took an offering and that offering was what we came to columbus with so we took that we started the church bank account um with with that offering um from there then we uh, worked with the church multiplication network okay. um, who said, we'll do matching funds. So if you, if you can raise X, we'll match up t- to this. Um, so it gave us incentive on fundraising. Um, the Ohio Ministry Network said, hey, we'll give you a little bit. So we just went like ground and pound. So okay. it, it was, it was uh, that, it was churches. We wrote support, you know, 150 support letters. We built a support team, asked them to write support letters. So we had, you know, Twenty dollars come in came in from Tennessee from your Sunday school teacher yep. from 1982. <laughs> you know yep. we were getting it all over to just you know be able to raise money, kind of scrappy. And but then we took jobs. Say, so, yeah, so I, I worked three jobs. You weren't bivocational. You were tri-vocational. I was tri-vocational. So I worked <laughs> the front desk at a fitness club. I worked at a golf course, and I worked for the church. And then my my wife uh, worked two or three jobs, depending on how you look at it. Right, right. But we also saw that as every dollar the church didn't have to pay us, we could put into savings. Because right. we were trying to create a little bit of margin early on so that we would never sort of be captive to paycheck to paycheck and, and, and be totally desperate. Not right. that we had, like you said, big coffers full of money, but at the same time, we were trying to be prudent and frugal up front so that we could have a little bit of margin um, and, and not be putting ourselves or the church in a, in a rough position. So that first, you know, first year and a half was super scrappy. I mean, you know, we were as t- tight as we could be in our personal budget, uh, you know, as lean and mean as we could be. And uh, that's kind of how we did it. Well, you, you tell the story, and like you just tell it briefly, about um, your job at the fitness center yeah. and how the purpose of it was, A, you needed money. Yeah. You needed, you needed to pay bills. Mm-hmm. So that's, that was A. But B, it was a great opportunity to, because you're brand new to the community. You yep. don't have this built-in network that you just fell into. Yep. You had to build your own network. Yeah. Um, so that fitness job sort of was one of those ways in which you did it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to me, it was important coming into a new community. I didn't want to just roll in with a Bible and go, here's how you all ought to live. Mm-hmm. I-, I wanted to integrate in the community. I wanted to become one of them. 
So I wanted to take a job. Now, I know there are some church planners that would tell you, don't do that, it's too hard to do. You know, you need to be focused. And I'm not here to say every church planner ought to get a job, but for me, that job served a lot of purposes. One, it helped provide for my family and helped our church save money. But I came in, people still, so many of them know me as, a, as an employee of the community before I was the pastor preaching the sermon. And so I found a hub, which was a fitness center with 8,000 members, okay? So I went in and in my mind, I, I, I became the front desk guy, but in my mind, I was the pastor of that gym. Whether they yeah. knew it or not, yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna learn these people's names. I'm gonna learn their stories. They I'm probably gonna... didn't know it. They did not know it. <laughs> it took them a long yeah, time yeah. to figure it out. But I, I, I learned their names. I learned their stories. I did, I'm not kidding you, pastoral care. I did weddings. Um, I counseled marriages. I had a guy, I was, he was complaining to me about his wife. Didn't know I was a pastor. I started talking to him about love languages, Gary Chapman. Yep. And this is like <laughs> revolutionary. He's like, oh my goodness. You know, his wife is acts of service and he was physical touch. Right. And she wouldn't give him any touch because he wasn't helping her out. Okay, exactly. so, so I'm sitting here explaining this, you know, it's kind of like Spanish and French. She's speaking this year. He went and got her off a treadmill, brought her to the front desk. And I'm making a smoothie, scanning people in and counseling their marriage. So what it did was, it did a lot. One, it helped our church and myself establish trust within the community. Um, it really fortified me, even I was saying my commitment and my love and my heart for our community right. um, because I really knew the people. Right. And, and it, you know, it bought us some time, you know, to really um, start to establish and gave me time to fundraise and get, you know, find where is the right place for us to meet and to do all of that. Right. Um, so it, it, was, it was a beautiful time, probably some of the most fruitful ministry I've ever done. It kind of prevented you from maybe making some quick wrong decisions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because you can roll into a community and go, that's it. Yes. If had you waited six months, it had been, well, that's not it. Yes. Maybe we could go here and so that exactly. I think it also helps. I think one of the things that I was a youth pastor and served in the church many years ago, but I think the fact that you know you you are able to preach sermons from being an employee yeah. out in the world, rubbing shoulders with non Christians, <clears throat> that's a credibility gap that sometimes pastors have. Yeah. You know, you're in a church all week, you know, you're around Christians all week, you get to prepare sermons all week. Um, but being able to say, No, no, I I work here and I rub mm -hmm. shoulders with non Christians, I'm out being salt and light just like you guys yeah that, that's a that helps close that credibility gap quite a bit yeah well honestly i enjoyed it tremendously and, and I, I it changed a lot for me even my my mentality like honestly before i did that a lot of times i would preach and i would be very almost i would say overly simple uh sympathetic on how hard it is to work in the world so i would you know i know it's tough out there you know it's it's a dark place you know that world's so dark out there and and, and it, so we just try to make it through the week so we can get back to church and hunker down and, and 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 you know i found when i worked in the in the world simply being salt and light i stuck out like a sore thumb yeah i, I had a lady when when i uh, put in my two weeks i uh, worked the job for over a year i put in my two weeks and i let her know hey i'm a uh, I'm going to be gone next week, you know, and she's like, oh, where are you going? I said, oh, actually, I started a church. I'm a pastor at a church, and we got it going, and now I'm going to do it. She's like, I knew something was up with you. I said, what do you mean? She said, the way you talk about your wife. Mm. I said, what? She said, you just talk about your wife with such honor, and I just knew there was something different about you, and, I, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, that's all you got to do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. not that hard. Yeah, that's not in the four <laughs> spiritual laws. Is it? <laughs> Learning people's names, yeah. treating them with honor and respect, and and talking kindly about your spouse instead of her being a ball and chain. Yeah. This is my, you know, someone who I honor. And to her, this it, it, it somehow elevated me. And frankly, I was the lowest man at the gym. I was the front desk guy. Yeah. yeah. And yet, in some way, that ministered to her. And I thought, man. I just want to keep challenging our people. Go be salt and light at work. Yeah, it's a dark place, but dark places are great places to be in the flashlight business. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is there, is there any, um, like when you, you know, packed up the U-Haul or whatever and came down, you may have had some conceptions of what church planting was. Did, did you have any, like, one or two conceptions that were just totally wrong? It's like, or did you have some that were right, that you're like, yeah, this is what I thought it would be? Yeah, I, I actually, it actually went faster than I expected. And, and part of it was I wanted, I really, I, I, I wanted to do it the way I felt was right, which was 
organic and healthy. And I was willing to kind of go slow at first. So I thought, man, it might take us three years to get this off the ground. Frankly, because of that job, because of the volume of people, 8,000 members, and I was the early shift guy, so I had new people coming in every day, and I'm seeing people consistently, right? So if, if you're coming, I mean, we, we became friends pretty quick right. and, and um, all of that. Because of that, we were able to kind of get some people together quickly. Um, probably the biggest surprise was when our church grew, we grew with a lot of people who were very foreign to church, and were baby Christians, although they were, a lot of them educated, very smart, very intelligent people. They were brand new to church. And on the outside looking in, that looks really romantic and cool. Like, oh, it's a church of all new believers. That was one of the most stressful things of my life. I, I felt like I was in a spiritual nursery with 50 babies mm. by myself and really feeling irresponsible. Like, I can't get to this stuff. Right. And, and um, feeling like we didn't have enough help. I, didn't, I couldn't train people fast enough. Um, and certainly I wasn't trying to go nab people out of other churches. So I would say the, the fact that we had so many new believers, although it was inspiring and exciting, um, because we lacked the infrastructure and the leaders and all of that, we just, especially those first couple of years, I lived sort of paranoid feeling like, what did we, we just created something we can't even manage yet. Right. Right. There's no parents in the nursery. There's no parents. Like, it's well, let's let's pivot to that then. Let's talk a little bit about you know, um, you know, finances are a huge issue, but so is leadership development. Um, you got a bunch of baby Christians. You need to activate a volunteer base, mm -hmm. but the volunteers need to be. I mean, we're gonna have small groups. Well, you got people who can lead a small group. You know, if everybody's a baby Christian, so <coughs> how did you start? You know, as you as you started launching, and you you know. How did you start pouring in discipling or uh, that whole leadership development part of the church plan? How'd that go? Yeah, so it, it <laughs> be honest to say, it, 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 was a, it was a challenge. It was a struggle. And, and I probably never felt, and even to this day, don't always feel like we're hitting it out of the park. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I feel like we're playing from behind. I think to try to organize it in my mind, if you kind of separate, okay, if we're talking leadership development, Let's talk about, when you talk about like volunteerism or servant leaders, there are some things and roles that you, I think we do a service to people to make it very systematic. In other words, if, if there's a role at the church for counting uh, the kids, right? And if I just say, hey, doctor, can you go count the kids? Okay, any way you want. Um, that seems empowering, but it's kind of overwhelming. In a right. sense, it'd be better for me to hand you a note card and say, at 10 minutes after... I want you to count every head in the room and then take that number and go to www. Yeah. and enter that in and then this by this time and then we're done and you go check 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 done right so so take uh, some of the pressure off yes yeah. so go as granular as you can in in those roles that we're just turning the crank we got to do it every week hosting the door what time do you want me there you know put a smile on your face right. here's how we do fist bump at 10 feet from you you begin addressing the person go down to the details. I think a lot of times leaders who want to be empowering keep things vague in areas where people actually want detail. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that category of like, here's a role, I want to do it well. When you think leadership development, right, leadership development is more than, like, if, if you're developing me as a leader, you don't just say, Greg, here's the four things you do all the time. In a sense, you give me some education, mm -hmm. but so much of it is actually kind of slow, and it's case by case. It's you asking me questions, and you giving me the ability to fail, and giving me a safe spot, and then coaching me back up there, and knowing, you know, there's some real art to that. Okay. And so I think, whereas I can train people for the doors, or I can train people to make the coffee in bulk, and we can expedite it. We can right. do it in 30 minutes, uh, and then manage it. But when it comes to leadership, really getting the best out of leaders and that's slow that's process that's in real time that's high maintenance that's all of that it's ecosystem right it's right? up close and personal yeah, yeah you think system and ecosystem yeah. i remember steve covey in his book uh, seven habits of highly effective people would tell a story about um you know, he wanted his son he thought his son was old enough to cut the lawn so he told his son you know you need to cut the yard and trim it and, uh, he, you know, he didn't realize he had to go into more detail. So he came home, the son had done it, but it was awful, you know. And so he said, okay, 
next time, here's what we're going to do. And so he went out and he had his son watch him cut the yard. He gave him the words uh, clean and green. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he wanted the lines going a certain way. He wanted the edges looking a certain way. He wanted the uh, grass blown off the driveway. You know, he had to show him. This is, when I say cut the lawn, this, this is what I mean by cut the lawn. Mm -hmm. And eventually that mentoring took over to where, you know, he didn't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, so if you think of that progression, and somebody taught me this years ago, I can't remember who, but it was, you watch me, right. you help me, I help you, I watch you. Now, if we're setting up and tearing down the chairs, that might be one or two days and you get it. Right. Right? I just watch you do it. Okay, and this is how I do it, and you explain it. Then I now I'm your helper. And now you go, Greg, now you do it. And then you're helping me. And then eventually you're watching me and I don't need you anymore. In, in a task like that, th that's pretty quick. When it comes to leadership, if you're trying to teach me how to be a college president, the you watch me, you help me, I help you, I watch you might be years right, right. of going, here's how you run a board meeting. Here's how you solve a problem. How here's how you manage tension. How quickly did you move from, like, was, were small groups or cell groups a, 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 like a quick part thing that you wanted to do right away or did that take time? It took time. Now, we tried right out of the gate, but again, we had, number one, we, we had so many people who were new to church. The idea of a group, a cell group, that there was some salesmanship we had to give to that. If you, you come to our church, you're probably like, hey, wh what do you guys have for groups? Right. Because you already have that paradigm. These guys, we had to talk them into it. And then the fact that we had to be honest about, we're, we didn't have competent leaders yet. People who are even in a position spiritually to be able to do that. So we had to figure out how do we train them as best we can? Um, how do we lower the barrier to entry enough without sacrificing the quality? All of that tension everybody faces. But early on, it, it just, yeah, it was a battle. I mean, we had more people coming to the church than we had infrastructure and capacity to be able to get them into those smaller groups. Okay, that may be a unique problem within church planning as well. You know, having too many people too fast. Um, yeah. When you think about the finances, I think of, when I think of church planning, I think of that being a, a huge uh, stressor. You know, um, you know, if I go to a, if I'm the senior pastor and I'm called to be the senior pastor of a church at 900, um, I'm interested in the salary, but I'm not worried about it. If I'm going to go off to Columbus and start my own church, um, finances become a like it, it raises to the level of pretty high priority. Um, how long did it take, or was there any advice that you would give to, you know, I've seen where it takes sometimes, I saw a stat on Christianity Today where it takes 80% uh, of church plants five years to be self-sustaining. Um, and the idea that you can be self-sustaining, we'll give you a, we'll help you out, we're a mother church, we'll help you out, but in three years we're sunsetting you and you've got to be on your own. Well, less than half the churches who church plant are self-sustaining in three years. So, you know, what was some of the things that you did? Again, yours might be a unique situation, but you worked jobs, you were frugal, um, you had a, a network of people who were also asking, but you had a matching organization. Mm -hmm. What are some things that helped you manage the finances? And at what year did you sort of, you know, were you on your own at that point? Yeah, so what we tried to do, as I mentioned earlier, early on, tried to create some margin to where whenever we did kind of become self-sustaining or I went full-time at the church or we, we took some risk, we at least had bought ourselves time to grow into that risk. So that, that's where um, we didn't spend all the money that we had out of the gate. And what I tried to do was um, take advantage of fundraising opportunities. When I say take advantage, I don't mean that in a manipulative way. I right. mean, don't just go into operations for things we can raise money for. So I'll give you an example. We did five... We did five preview services before we launched the church. It was once a month. Our first preview service, we had enough money in the bank, technically, if we had spent most all of it. I could have bought a sound system. I could have bought chairs. I could have bought all this. We didn't have, the only thing we bought for our first preview service was kids' check-in equipment. Mm. And I told everybody that. Hey, guys, the only thing we bought kids checking equipment because you'll forgive us for uncomfortable chairs but you won't forgive us if we lose your kids <laughs> yeah okay yeah, yeah, that's a big so, one so this is a priority yeah okay now our project the projector was borrowed it was terrible sound system was awful everything was bad but what i did there was i said hey we're new we need to raise money um we asked people to do four things come serve give tell mm -hmm. come like a lot of churches you don't show up they don't even know 
There's only a few of us here. If you don't come next time, we're, we're going to know. We're going to know. <laughs> Please yeah. come. I'm, we're asking you to just come. You, you, you are uh, blessing this thing by just being here. Some, next, serve. You know, would you, would you serve? And then we had a finite period of time. Would you serve up to launch? Uh, give. You know, we got to buy everything. And tell. Would you bring somebody with you next time? So we, um, within that, we, we, instead of just pulling all of that out of the money I had raised and we had raised, we had a unique fundraising opportunity so we didn't have to dip into the operational margin. I could keep it there to protect us so that when we take that next risk, me going full-time to the church, or again, us getting a permanent facility that might go, oh, this is a great spot and a great location. We love the building, but it's a little, it's, it's, it's expensive. Right. Okay, if you decide to take that risk, it's better off with $30,000 in the bank than it is with $1,000 right. in the bank. Right, yeah. So that, that was part of how, you know, again, I was trying to sort of hedge, hedge us in a little bit with some of that. On top of that, um, I had a guy, actually, I, so, so I really tried to take all of the people who were strong in that area and just learn as much as I could. I, I had a guy who is um, kind of a financial whiz, a money whiz, and he gave me a real nice compliment one time. He said, he goes, man, one of the things I respected about you out of the gate is you were comfortable in what you didn't know, mm -hmm. and you were willing to ask and be a student. You didn't seem self-conscious about what you didn't know. And I would be honest, I'd just be like, hey, when, when I'm looking at this P&L, you know, what should I be looking at? <laughs> yeah. What are you looking at? Explain, right. how do you see this? And I would just pester him with questions because I saw it as a mentoring opportunity. And I think probably what his life experience had told him, sometimes people that are undereducated in one of those areas are insecure that they act like they know right. and they don't right. know. So they, right. it ends up being stunting their growth. Right. So I saw that as an opportunity to go, let me get good people around me and let me be as inquisitive as I can to try to try to get better at this. For someone who's, you know, trying to church plan, trying to make the segue also to people who may not have that person. Was, was that one of the people who were sort of part of your church plan? Was he already in there? Actually, no. It, okay. was a, it was a guy I met at the front desk at the gym. It's kind of a cool story, but at one point he had been the CFO of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and he was working for a, a, a company and frankly, he was a Catholic guy okay. and um, actually never came to our church. Okay. And, and I, I just said, hey, uh, I, can, you, can we meet up and if I buy you a cup of coffee, can I pester you with some money questions and all this? And, and he ended up helping me for like the first year and a half. We met almost monthly. Well, and that's actually, that makes my point and that is that, you know, Sometimes people sit back and go, well, that's great. You had, a finance, you had the CFO of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers sitting in your church. Uh, no, I didn't. But I knew enough that I needed help in this area. So if you're a church planner and you don't have that kind of person in your church plant, you can find people. Mm -hmm. And they love to. There are many wonderful people out there who are willing to give advice. You know, they're, how, how refreshing that he wasn't being asked for a check. Yeah. You know, hey, you know, you're a CFO for the Buccaneers. You can write a check. Yeah. So you're nice to him, you buy him coffee, but he knows you're actually trying to find his wallet. And you're like, I'm not interested in your wallet. I need some help. And church planners need to maybe humble themselves and say, this is what I don't know. And a lot of ministers, you know, they don't minor in business. You know, right. they, they major in Bible, theology, disciple making, you know, whatever it is, maybe public speaking. Mm -hmm. And then they get out there and they've got a budget. And they don't know which, you know, Excel spreadsheet is not their love language. Yeah. So, uh, well, you, you know, what's crazy is that guy never gave us a dollar. I never asked him for it. But if I had to try to quantify the dollar amount of the education and the advice he gave me, I don't think I could. Exactly. It's massive. Yeah. And I'm still reaping it from 12, 13 years ago. And it's funny because I'll have church planners who will, I, I meet with church planners every month. And I'll have some who will reach out and we'll, we'll meet up. And within a minute, they're asking me for money. And I'm sitting here thinking, why did you not ask me for advice? Exactly. Why didn't you ask me? Because actually, whether I give you money or not, my advice is worth something. Yeah. And, and the chan the op actually, the likelihood of me giving you money will probably have something to do with how insightful your question was and how <laughs> receptive you were. And then I might actually offer you money you don't even have to ask. Exactly. But if I don't, you still came out with major value. Right. So I think going, going into that, and the, the thing is with this guy, uh, Tom, he, me asking him for, for, for CFO advice 
was probably about our 25th conversation. Okay. I'm making that up. Right, right. But what I'm saying is I already knew his name before I knew what he even did for a living, what his background right. was. So, it, you know, I, I think, again, it's easy to sit and go, you know, when's God going to send us leaders? Yeah, that'd be nice if, if they just showed up ready-made. Right. Very rarely does that happen. That's a unicorn. Right. You got to go out and find them. You know, if, if you got a worship leader going, we can't get a drummer. Well, how many hours have you spent at Guitar Center just talking to people right where are the drummers you better right. go hang out at, at you know open mic nights or whatever you know exactly. where bands are playing yeah. go find people yeah. go stick your nose in there get, yeah. get in the mix you know start learning people's names and then those opportunities will start to emerge but for the most part i think the people that do leadership development the best are the ones that find people uh, proactively and then the ones that do show up they're going they see the potential in that person and begin investing in them uh, and eventually get long-term return. Great. Maybe there's another Tom for the Buccaneers you could get going with your church. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he's still around, but you know, he could help your church. Um, did you have any um, uh, fallout like from year one to year 11 where some core people, you know, they started with you, but then they, you know, they just said, you know, this is not what we thought. Or yeah. Sometimes they get moved by their company, but did, how did you deal? Did you have some turnover? Definitely. And, and I would say, I think for pastors and church planners, the same heart that leads you to go into a community and start a church is the same heart that makes you vulnerable to being hurt by people, mm -hmm. whether they meant to or not. I mean, you can look back with an objective mind and go, eh, no harm, no foul, so to speak. Nobody was a villain here, but I, I'm wounded. You know, I'm, I'm sad, I'm hurt. You know, there was damage done to the relationship. It's never gonna be the same. So absolutely that happened. And, I, and, I, and it was a process of me learning to not take things personally or to me to not harbor me learning how to forgive. Um, and then even to deal with just some of the complex emotions around, even though I don't fault anybody, I just don't like how this ended up. And I mean, we, we had some close friends that uh, entered into the risk with us early, relocated to help us. and. I mean, we tried everything to try to make those relationships work, but it really got down to uh, he needed to lead something else. He needed to lead his own thing uh, to be able to sit at the head of the table, and I think God's gifted him for leadership. And we kept trying to, we had a really cool thing in our mind's eye. You know, man, we'll do life together, and we'll raise our families together, and we'll share, and we'll do this. And I'm not saying that can't work. I mean, I think our hearts were in the right place, but within that, it just got to a place where we kept trying things and it was getting worse. So no matter how much you try to take the high road, those things hurt, you know? And I found myself having some hard feelings toward, toward him. And I would say he probably had some toward me. And then I had some toward myself. I'm like, you know, maybe I could have done this different and that different. So that, was, that did take a lot of energy. There were times I just needed my wife to look at me and tell me I wasn't a jerk um, and go through that process of healing and then, and then learn from it and go, okay, how do I reset expectations and not allow that pain to then cause me to shut myself off from other people and you know because you can you can start anticipating well every staff member is going to hurt me right and they're right. all going to walk out like this yeah. and, and then you end up having your heart start to become hard you know yeah. so i would say in the first few years i i kind of hit an emotional exhaustion mm -hmm. that wasn't just due to that you know there was a lot of it was just due to all of the adrenaline that you're having in this risky position of right. trying to plant a church and is this even going to work and trying to raise your family and do it all. And then you throw in the middle of that close relationships that end up fractured very hard. Yeah. And, and, and then, like you said, turnover, you know, every church planner I've ever talked to thinks they're the exception to the rule that, you know, everybody that started with them, we're going to grow old together right. and this is going to work. I don't think that usually happens. <laughs> I think yeah, mo no. most part you have to somewhat, uh, get used to that attrition. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems to happen to everybody. Sometimes we forget the God who called us to this city might be calling some of those people to another city. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so uh, assuming that culture doesn't just happen, yeah. and that, you know, one of the things that was on your heart in Toledo was <clears throat> you had some thoughts about what church should be, mm -hmm. about what the culture of the church should be. You know, what, what, you know, what did you want your church 
oh, it's the Lord's church, but what did you want one church to, what was the culture that you wanted to have, and how did you intentionally go about? Because, you know, I've attended your church, and there's definitely a culture, all right? It's, yeah. It's, it's not like other churches, you know? Um, so what was that culture? What was burning in your mind, and then how did you put that imprint? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that compliment. You yeah. know, it, if you th- think about two things. So systems, systems are how things move. Culture is how things feel, right? Your family, your family has systems. We're going to, we're going somewhere. What are our systems of getting everyone in the car, getting everyone dressed? Somebody makes an announcement, we're leaving, da, 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 who's getting Miles' shoes on? Who's doing this, this? So those are the systems of how it moves. The culture is how it feels. Once we get in the car, what are we doing? We cranking music and singing together? Is it dead quiet? Does everybody get on their phones? Do we argue? What's up? How does it feel in the car? So I think in the same way, uh, entities, churches, organizations have the same type of thing. We're usually really intentional about the systems, how it moves. How do we get people from point A to point B? But what about the culture? And I think cultures often um, are vague because it's hard to define. We kind of accidentally ended up into it. And here's, here's what happened few years in, we started getting our culture complimented. So people would say, oh, the culture here is great. It's healthy. Okay, we kept hearing that our culture was great and healthy. And we were like, oh, what is it? Like, <laughs> yeah. like we didn't have a definition yeah. for it. And, and uh, I think as Andy Stanley said, you have to do an autopsy on success. Because if you don't know why it's working when it's working, you won't know why it stopped working when it stopped working. Mm-hmm. So what we did was we took some time to study ourselves and to go, what is our culture? We need to bring definition to it. So we took a a couple of months as a staff and uh, every week we would talk about it and we were able to bring it into definition. So we we, we created a, a language for it and word pictures for it. And now it's something that we're able, since we can understand it and define it. Now we can, we can train people to it and we can hold people accountable to it. And we know when someone's off, because if your culture is vague, I come into your culture and I'm just behaving and you go, well, Greg's not a culture fit. I'm like, why not? I don't know. You're just not a fit. You're just, you're just not a, a, an OCU guy. Yeah. I can just tell. Yeah. There's an OCU, you know, we, we, we know an OCU guy when we see him. And I want to be an OCU guy. I just don't know what it is. Right. You, you know, so we established four what we call cultural behaviors that we go, this is how we behave in our culture that creates it. And, and we've literally uh, had people transition out because they weren't consistent in the cultural behavior, held accountable. And we literally have had people say, yeah, I don't want to do that. Okay. okay. Then this is the wrong fit because the, because. Uh, who is it? Peter Drucker says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Exactly, yeah. Can I ask you what some of those four are? Yeah, I'll, I'll give them to you. So the first one is um, selfless generosity. Okay, selfless generosity. So our, our word picture is your baby's my baby. So everybody loves uh, their own baby, but not everybody loves other people's baby. So if, if kids has a problem, music has a problem. If creative has a problem, operations has a problem. So the idea that we... Um, we're, we're selflessly generous. We're going to help each other, and, and we will shade to the part of the organization that needs okay, help. Okay, so I don't have to literally love your baby, okay? Right. Okay, okay. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> okay so selfless generosity. Um, uh, the second is missional commitment. Okay. So we say we are actually about what we say we're about. We're committed to the mission. Uh, and, and we say we're a battleship, not a cruise ship. We'll use language like lend your sword to the fight. So we keep the mission in focus. Um, the, the next is honest evaluation. Honest evaluation, which is we say we put the skunk on the table. Mm-hmm. And we say everybody has, to be in this, a leader in our organization, you have to have two superpowers. First, you have to be unoffendable. And our psychology around that is this. If I'm trying to offend you, okay, I'm giving you feedback, I'm giving you evaluation, and I'm trying to offend you, then I'm a jerk. And the punishment for me being a jerk is that I don't get to offend you. Right. Okay? So you got to be unoffendable, and everyone's approachable. So I can't say, well, I don't go to Dr. Kalaga because he's unapproachable. He's, 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 
He's a doctor. He's got his doctorate, you know, and, and he's serious all the time. So if I, I you no, know, you, you, there is no, I didn't go to him because he outranks me or because he's got a big personality. Everyone is approachable. And if you're not approachable and you're easily offended and defensive, then you are out of alignment right. with the culture. So what does that do? It allows us to be truth tellers when we evaluate the stuff we do. I'll tell you this. I've had people ask me over the years, what do you attribute the growth of the church? What would you attribute it to most? Obviously, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Right. It's in him we live, move, and have our being. If I had to put it to something practical, it would be our willingness to bludgeon problems to death with honest evaluation. If you hung around our office on meeting Monday and you listened in like a fly on the wall, you would hear people putting problems, like telling the truth, putting problems down, and just pound, we just relentlessly trying new things to solve this problem. They, problems just don't go unaddressed okay. within our culture. So that's the third one. The fourth one is genuine affirmation. That's another thing. If you hung around, you'd, you'd almost be uncomfortable with how much people affirm each other. And it's not like, oh yeah, Dr. Clark, he's the man. He's the man. Oh, you, man. You're so, oh, you're just you, that's man, flattery. you're just so, that's flattery. That's, yeah. that's an insult. Honest evaluation is specific and true to the place it can, it's almost hard to receive it. It makes you almost embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're a, a kid's leader is complimenting someone, they're not going, oh, I just, I just love you, man. You're so cool. They're going to say, hey, let me tell you what, what I noticed. Number one, I've noticed you're always the first person to, to accept planning center. You always show up on time. I can't thank you enough. And number, number three, I saw you the other day when that child came in and they, they wouldn't go into kids' ministry. I saw you get down on one knee, go eyeball to eyeball, and engage. Now that whole family came in because you got down on that kid's level. How did you think to do that? Yeah. Okay, that is honest, or I'm sorry, genuine affirmation right. on something specific. So if you think about it, if we're really committed to the mission, if we are genuinely affirming one another, okay, so I know that you actually hold me in high esteem. When you come and honestly evaluate me, say, Greg, I didn't think that was your best. You've already built a foundation of affirmation right. in this relationship. And now I, I don't think you have it out for me. Now we're just telling the truth. Okay, and you're willing to lend your sword to the fight. And, and not only am I giving you this, but I want to help you do it as well. Yeah, we, you know, we have, a, we have annual performance reviews here. And, and one of the things, you know, there's a lot of people who fear those. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you know, I, I've never feared a performance appraisal. You know, because number one, my, my notion is, if you've got a problem of something I'm doing, you should have told me and not sat on it for 12 months, right? And yeah. waited for my performance appraisal. So if there's a problem, if I have a problem with you, you'll know about it. Yeah. And I won't wait for the performance appraisal. Yeah. And number two, that is the time for genuine affirmation. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you formalize evaluation, when it's honest and it's healthy, that is a great intentional time to affirm somebody. Yep. And so I, I always look forward to my evaluations. Uh, I think, I think so, you know, sometimes, you know, some people are natural at it. Yeah. They, they just do it all the time. But I think it's actually the people who aren't naturally good at it that have some of the most powerful, genuine affirmations. Yeah. If, if, if you're not the type of person who's always giving everyone, if you give me that, I'll never forget it. Right, yeah. And, and I do think it is a skill. It, it's really you seeing it and saying it. And I think, again, I'm kind of wired sometimes to honestly see what's broken, and you train yourself to see what's right and then to, to verbalize it. You know, it just, it creates a healthy culture. So we, we kind of did it backwards. It was actually already working. Then we went backwards and understood it, and now, now we hold people accountable to it. We, we actually, we had a staff member that came in, and when they first heard it, they were like, yeah, that's cool. And after, over time, they thought, you know, the um, selfless generosity thing the more I'm in it, I, I don't think I agree with that. They're like, I just think we all ought to do our job. I shouldn't have to help you with your baby. If you take care of your baby, I'll take care of my baby. We're good. I'm like, okay, then this isn't the place for you. Now, now certainly we're not trying to create irresponsible people that right, don't right. take care of their job. Of course, everyone needs to do their right. job. But if, if you don't take joy in, you know, seeing it that way and doing it, then this isn't the place. Well, a healthy separation also helps you prevent mission drift yeah because if you allow that person to stay 
mm -hmm. who's already said, I'm not aligning with one of the mission values. Yep. Y you've started to drift. I'm trying to remember who it was that said, culture is both what you proactively create and what you tolerate. Mm. So if I work for you and, and, and I'm out of alignment and you tolerate me, I just created the culture. Yeah. Versus yeah. you go, I don't care who, I don't care how much I like you. We don't tolerate that. That essentially defines the culture. So one last question. You know, you've, you've got the heart of a church planner. Um, you're not planting one church anymore, although that may be always like one breath away um, from you. But you are in contact with people who are planting churches. You are in contact. You work for the, um, the network. Uh, what's the CMN? Yeah, Church Multiplication Network. The church Multiplication yep. Network. So has anything, and this will be our last question, has, has anything shifted um, church planning, I mentioned yesterday, you know, BC now is before coronavirus. Yeah. You know, so um, church planning 2015, 2014 versus church planning 2020, Are you hearing anything that's like, yeah, but you didn't do it in 2022. Mm -hmm. you, know, you got to do it in 2011. I mean, is there, what, is there a dynamic that's different that we need to be aware of? Yeah, so take this with a grain of salt. This is my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think probably the, the big shift is the opportunity to begin gaining trust and credibility digitally. So obviously you're looking for a footprint. You want to gather people. There's no replacing human beings being in the same room, the kinetic energy, the proximity. It's important. But I think like when, when I got to town, you know, 11 years ago, 13, 12 years ago, I came in and no one knew who I was. No one knew who one church was. We had no identity, no reputation, no trust. So how did we gain that? Well, I gained it at the front desk and I gained it in the chamber of commerce and I gained it at the parade when we handed out water and, and all of this. And I'm not saying don't do those things. That may, may be appropriate in the context of your community. But I think now with so many eyeballs on social media, on YouTube, on Facebook, on all these streaming platforms, I think a church could probably find a smaller facility, probably invest in tech, invest in cameras, invest in a, a set. I mean, you, you, they're watching this right now. They have no idea how big this room is. Right. Okay, this is a big room. Yeah. But this room could be a, a, a quarter this size. Easily. And, and yet this content is going out and it is what it is. Right, it's the same thing. Same thing. So I think, you know, you could probably save money on physical footprint, invest in the digital footprint and start to gain some traction. Put out really good stuff. Don't fall for the assumption that you can't create a genuine spiritual encounter digitally. We have people like getting saved in other countries right. watching online. We're praying for people online. Baptisms are happening 10 states away. We're dedicating babies in New York City. You can do this stuff. I'm not saying it's the be all end all. I'm saying it might be the beginning. Right. And, and you can do that and start to, you know, everyone in your community isn't going to go to the parade, but everyone in your community has a smartphone and probably 95% of them have something that they're streaming in terms of social media. Right. So I think getting there, starting to establish who you are, your values, your heart for that community, and to see that as an opportunity. Don't see it as an app. See it as an extension of your community. You know, in the day, you'd have gone to the rec center and played ball and made friends. Do that. I mean, do that if that's you. But I think on top of that, a lot of those people are on YouTube. They're on Facebook. And so I think that's an opportunity. Before you start taking a bunch of physical risk on physical footprint, mm -hmm. you could really get some traction digitally. Great, great. Well, Greg, I want to thank you. Um, we could talk a lot longer about this, but I want to thank you for uh, your time here on campus, the time with the Foundry Institute, but also um, as a dad, uh, thank you for um, the biblical uh, preaching that you know, my three sons um, sit under, and um, I know that they're um, being fed meat, you know, and they're being challenged to um, be more like Christ. And, thank you. Uh, you know, you, you hope when you raise your kids, they land somewhere that does that, right? And um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Okay, that's going to do it for the Foundry Institute uh, on church planning. Thanks a lot.